Only a few days of operation the boiler would become coated with depositive salt reducing performance and increasing the risk of a boiler explosion. Starting about 1834, the use of surface condensers on ships eliminated fouling of the boilers and improved engine efficiency. 50. Evaporated water cannot be used for subsequent purposes, other than rain somewhere, whereas river water can be reused. In all cases, the steam plant boiler feed water, which must be kept pure, is kept separate from the cooling water or air. An injector uses a jet of steam to force water into the boiler. Injectors are inefficient but simple enough to be suitable for use on locomotives. Water pump. Most steam boilers have a means to supply water whilst at pressure so that they may be run continuously. Utility and industrial boilers commonly use multi-stage centrifugal pumps, however, other types are reused. Another means of supplying lower pressure boiler feed water is an injector, which uses a steam jet usually supplied from the boiler. Injectors became popular in the 1850s but are no longer widely used, except in applications such as steam locomotives. 51. It is the pressurization of the water that circulates through the steam boiler that allows the water to be raised to temperatures well above 100 degrees C, 212 degrees Fahrenheit, boiling point of water at one atmospheric pressure and by that means to increase the efficiency of the steam cycle. Monitoring and control. For safety reasons, nearly all steam engines are equipped with mechanisms to monitor the boiler such as a pressure gauge and a sight glass to monitor the water level. Many engines, stationary and mobile, are also fitted with a governor to regulate the speed of the engine U without the need for human interference. Richards Indicator Instrument half 1875. See, Indicator Diagram, below. The most useful instrument for analyzing the performance of steam engines is the steam engine indicator. Early versions were in use by 1851, 52, but the most successful indicator was developed for the high-speed engine inventor and manufacturer Charles Porter by Charles Richard and exhibited at London Exhibition in 1862.25. The steam engine indicator traces on paper the pressure in the cylinder throughout the cycle, which can be used to spot various problems and calculate a developed horsepower. 53. It was routinely used by engineers, mechanics and insurance inspectors. The engine indicator can also be used on internal combustion engines. See image of indicator diagram below, in types of motor units section, dot governor. Centrifugal governor in the Bolton and Watt engine 1788 lap engine. Dot the centrifugal governor was adopted by James Watt for use on a steam engine in 1788 after Watt's partner Bolton saw one on the equipment of a flour mill Bolton and Watt were building. Dot 54. The governor could not actually hold a set speed, because it would assume a new constant speed in response to load changes. The governor was able to handle smaller variations such as those caused by fluctuating heat load to the boiler. Also, there was a tendency for oscillation whenever there was a speed change. As a consequence, engines equipped only with this governor were not suitable for operations requiring constant speed, such as cotton spinning. 55. The governor was improved over time and coupled with variable steam cutoff. Good speed control in response to changes in load was attainable near the end of the 19th century. Engine configuration. Simple engine. In a simple engine, or single expansion engine the charge of steam passes through the entire expansion process in an individual cylinder, although a simple engine may have even or more individual cylinders. 56. It is then exhausted directly into the atmosphere or into a condenser. As steam expands in passing through a high pressure engine, its temperature drops because no heat is being added to the system. This is known as adiabatic expansion and results in steam entering the cylinder at high temperature and leaving at lower temperature. This causes a cycle of heating and cooling of the cylinder with every stroke. 
which is a source of inefficiency. 57. The dominant efficiency loss in reciprocating steam engines is cylinder condensation and re-evaporation. The steam cylinder and adjacent metal parts forward slash ports operate at a temperature about halfway between the steam admission saturation temperature and the saturation temperature corresponding to the exhaust pressure. As high pressure steam is admitted into the working cylinder, much of the high temperature steam is condensed as water droplets onto the metal surfaces, significantly reducing the steam available for expansive work. When the expanding steam reaches low pressure, especially during the exhaust stroke, the previously deposited water droplets that had just been formed within the cylinder forward slash ports now boil away, re-evaporation, and this steam does no further work in the cylinder. There are practical limits on the expansion ratio of a steam engine cylinder, as increasing cylinder surface area tends to exacerbate the cylinder condensation and re-evaporation issues. This negates the theoretical advantages associated with a high ratio of expansion in an individual cylinder. 58. Compound engines. A method to lessen the magnitude of energy loss to a very long cylinder was invented in 1804 by British engineer Arthur Wolfe, who patented his Wolfe high-pressure compound engine in 1805. In the compound engine, high-pressure steam from the boiler expands in a high-pressure HP cylinder and then enters one or more subsequent lower-pressure LP cylinders. The complete expansion of the steam now occurs across multiple cylinders, with the overall temperature drop within each cylinder reduced considerably. By expanding the steam in steps with smaller temperature range, within each cylinder, the condensation and re-evaporation efficiency issue, described above, is reduced. This reduces the magnitude of cylinder heating and cooling, increasing the efficiency of the engine. By staging the expansion in multiple cylinders variations of torque can be reduced. 18. To derive equal work from lower pressure cylinder requires a larger cylinder volume as this steam occupies a greater volume. Therefore, the bore, and in rare cases the stroke are increased in low pressure cylinders, resulting in larger cylinders. 18. Double expansion usually known as compound, engines expanded the steam in two stages. The pairs may be duplicated or the work of the large low pressure cylinder can be split with one high pressure cylinder exhausting into one or the other, giving a three cylinder layout where cylinder and piston diameter are about the same, making the reciprocating masses easier to balance. 18. Two cylinder compounds can be arranged as cross compounds. The cylinders are side by side. Tandem compounds. The cylinders are end to end, driving a common connecting rod. Angle compounds. The cylinders are arranged in a V, usually at a 90 degrees angle, and drive a common crank. With two cylinder compounds used in railway work, the pistons are connected to the cranks as with a two cylinder simple at 90 degrees out of phase with each other, quartered. When the double expansion group I duplicated, producing a four-cylinder compound, the individual pistons within the group are usually balanced at 180 degrees, the groups being set at 90 degrees to each other. In one case, the first type of Vauclin compound, the pistons worked in the same phase driving a common crosshead and crank, again set at 90 degrees for a two-cylinder engine. With the three-cylinder compound arrangement, the LP cranks were either set at 90 degrees with the HP1 at 135 degrees to the other two, or in some cases, all three cranks were set at 120 degree. The adoption of compounding was common for industrial units, for road engines and almost universal for marine engines after 1880. It was not universally popular in railway locomotives where it was often perceived as complicated. This is partly due to the harsh railway operating environment and limited space afforded by the loading gauge, particularly in Britain, where compounding was never common and not employed after 1930. 
However, although never in the majority, it was popular in many other countries. 59. Multiple expansion engines. It is a logical extension of the compound engine, described above, to split the expansion into yet more stages to increase efficiency. The result is the multiple expansion engine. Such engines use either three or four expansion stages and are known as triple and quadruple expansion engines respectively. These engines use a series of cylinders of progressively increasing diameter. These cylinders are designed to an animation of a simplified triple expansion engine. High pressure steam, red, enters from the boiler and passes through the engine, exhausting as low pressure steam, blue, usually to a condenser dot divide the work into equal shares for each expansion stage. As with the double expansion engine, if space is at a premium, then two smaller cylinders may be used for the low pressure stage. Multiple expansion engines typically had the cylinders arranged in line, but various other formations were used. In the late 19th century the Jaroslik Tweedy balancing system was used on some marine triple expansion engines. Yest engines divided the low pressure expansion stages between two cylinders, one at each end of the engine. This allowed the crankshaft to be better balanced, resulting in a smoother, faster responding engine UHIC ran with less vibration. This made the four cylinder triple expansion engine popular with larger passenger liners, such as the Olympic class, but this was ultimately replaced by the virtually vibration free turbine engine. It is noted, however, that triple expansion reciprocating steam engines were used to drive the World War II Liberty ships, by far the largest number of identical ships ever built. Over 2,700 ships were built, in the United States, from a British original design. The image in this section shows an animation of a triple expansion engine. The steam travels through the engine from left to right. The valve chest for each of the cylinders is to the left of the corresponding cylinder. Land based steam engines could exhaust their steam to atmosphere, as feed water was usually readily available. Prior to and during World War I, the expansion engine dominated marine applications, where LI vessel speed was not essential. It was, however, superseded by the British invention steam turbine. New Year speed was required for instance in warships, such as the Dreadnought battleships, and ocean liners. HMS Dreadnought of 1905 was the first major warship to replace the proven technology of their suprecating engine with the then novel steam turbine. 60. Types of motor units. Reciprocating piston. In most reciprocating piston engines, the steam reverses its direction of flow at each stroke counterflow, entering and exhausting from the same end of the cylinder. The complete engine cycle occupies on a rotation of the crank and two piston strokes. The cycle also comprises four events admission, expansion exhaust, compression. These events are controlled by valves often working inside a steam chest adjacent to the cylinder. The valves distribute the steam by opening and closing steam ports communicating with the cylinder end, S, and are driven by valve gear, of which there are many types. The simplest valve gears give events of fixed length during the engine cycle and often make the engine rotate in only one direction. Many however have a reversing mechanism which additionally can provide means for saving steam as speed and momentum are gained by gradually shortening the QTAF or rather shortening the admission event. This in turn proportionately lengthens the expansion period. However, a zone and the same valve usually controls both steam flows. A short QTAF at admission adversely affects the double acting stationary engine. This was the Comorn mill engine of the mid-19th century. Note F slide valve with concave, almost D-shaped underside. Schematic indicator diagram showing the four events in a double piston stroke. C. Monitoring and control, above, 
exhaust and compression periods which should ideal oil was be kept fairly constant, if the exhaust event is too brief. The totality of the exhaust steam cannot evacuate the cylinder, choking it and giving excessive air compression. Kick back. Dot. 61. In the 1840s and 1850s, there were attempts to overcome this problem by means of various patent valve gears with a separate, variable Q-tarf expansion valve riding on the back of the main slide valve. The latter usually had fixed or limited Q-tarf. The combined setup gave a fair approximation of the ID levens, at the expense of increased friction and wear and the mechanism tended to be complicated. The usual compromise solution has been to provide lap by lap thinning rubbing surfaces of the valve in such a way as to overlap the port on the admission side, with the effect that the exhaust side remains open for a longer period after cutoff on the admission side has so covered. This expedient has since been generally considered satisfactory for most purposes and makes possible the use of the simpler Stevenson, Joy and Wolskiert's motions. Callis, and later, poppet valve edges had separated mission and exhaust valve s driven by trip mechanisms or cams profiled so as to give ideal events. Most of these gears never succeeded outside of the stationary marketplace due to various other issues including leakage and more delicate mechanisms. 59, 62, Compression. Before the exhaust phase is quite complete, the exhaust side of the valve closes, shutting a portion of the exhaust steam inside the cylinder. This determines a compression phase where a cushion of steam is formed against which the piston does work whilst its velocity is rapidly decreasing. It moreover obviates the pressure and temperature shock, which will otherwise be caused by the sudden admission of the high pressure steam at the beginning of the following cycle. Lead. The above effects are further enhanced by providing lead, as was later discovered with the internal combustion engine. It has been found advantageous since the late 1830s to advance the admission phase giving the valve lead so that admission occurs a little before the end of the exhaust stroke in order to fill the clearance volume comprising the ports and the cylinder ends, not part of the piston swept volume, before the steam begins to exert effort on the piston. 63. Uniflow, or Uniflow, Engine Animation of a Uniflow steam engine. The poppet valves are controlled by the rotating camshaft at the top. High pressure steam enters, red, and exhausts yellow. Uniflow engines attempt to remedy the difficulties arising from the usual counterflow cycle where, during each stroke, the port and the cylinder walls will be cooled by the passing exhaust steam, whilst the hotter incoming admission steam will waste some of its energy in restoring the working temperature. The aim of the Uniflow is to remedy this defect and improve efficiency by providing an additional port uncovered by the piston at the end of each stroke making the steam flow only in one direction. By this means, the simple expansion Uniflow engine gives efficiency equivalent to that of classic compound systems with the added advantage of superior part load performance, and comparable efficiency to turbines for small engines below 1000 horsepower. However, the thermal expansion gradient Uniflow engines produce along the cylinder wall gives practical difficulties turbine engines. A rotor of a modern steam turbine used in a power plant A steam turbine consists of one or more rotors, rotating discs, mounted on a drive shaft, alternating with a series of stators, static discs, fixed to the turbine casing. The rotors have a propeller-like arrangement of blades at the outer edge. Steam acts upon these blades, producing rotary motion. The stator consists of a similar, but fixed, series of blades that serve to redirect the steam flow onto the next rotor stage. A steam turbine often exhausts into a surface condenser that provides a vacuum. The stages of a steam turbine are typically arranged to extract the maximum potential work from a specific velocity and pressure of steam, giving rise to a series of variably sized high and low pressure stages. 
Turbines are only efficient if they rotate at relatively high speed. Therefore they are usually connected to reduction gearing to drive lower speed applications, such as a ship's propeller. In the vast majority of large electric generating